once was a railroad here. For 63 years and 170 miles, it carried the economy of the San Juan mountain country in its consist. Mine, mill, smelter, timber, cattle, sheep, and beans. The Rio Grande Southern, or the Southern as it was known, helped make legends in gold and silver, in atomic energy, and pinto beans. It is often said that this was the most spectacular piece of mountain railroading anywhere in North America. ran through a land of incredible beauty across the highest passes served by railroad on the continent. This was a railroad not always loved by its customers and decidedly not by its keepers. It was the orphan child of court receivers and the unloved ward of the Rio Grande Railroad for all but three of its years of existence. Yet the bond was strong among those who worked for it. A pride born of adversity of rooftop snowdrifts, waist-deep flood, treacherous rock slide, of persuading rusty wheels to turn, of underpay and overwork, of salary cut, financial squeeze, all accepted with a kind of special pride in serving and a pioneer togetherness in making something work which really shouldn't have. on the contract yeah and went to Denver and got everything done and we didn't realize that you had to go back up and sign the contract when it was finished they called us up and told us we had the contract mm -hmm. so we started to work and it they come down from Denver all the big shots two of them and we want to know what they wanted well they wanted us to sign them contracts well, we do that, and so we did it. And the funny thing about cutting rail, you wouldn't believe it, but if you just notch that T and let it set a few minutes and give it a quick lift with a hammer, it'll bust. And if you hit it a lick and it don't break, it'll brace itself and there ain't no way you can, you'll have to cut it in two then. The, the goose saved the railroad at one time, you know, by hauling the mail and the light freight. Mm -hmm. It was on daily in Rico and Telluride and places, you know. And then it was uh, the instrument to tear it up from uh, on the pretty level track from the top of, of um, near the Mancus Hill mm -hmm. over to Hespers. They went around up there and it's almost leveled. Through there, and we used two flat cars and had a hundred ton on them. But it, it proved it not to be too satisfactory because eight men with the goose could pick up as much rail as 50 men with the train. Yeah, well, that was the nearest accident we had to where it was really be a catastrophe as we pushed the flat car up the track to Ofer, pretty near to Ofer, and it's on a 4% plus grade. And when you let something get away on that, on the rail, and that, it's just like it dropped in a well. And uh, 
We pushed it up there and set the brake up. Went down the road about five miles and happened to be on a little straight track and it must have been going 40 miles an hour when it hit us in the back end. And it coupled the goose together to where we didn't have any brake, but we had the, the engine was still hooked to it on compression and it knocked some teeth off of the ring gear. It hit it so hard. And I went out over the top and back and found the brake handle and got it figured where I could get a pry. And we got it stopped in about a mile and a half. We'd went up there and, and pushed it up through the snow, you know, and they, it was in the evening and it was cold. And the brake shoes was out where the air could get to them and that ice had water would go up against them brake shoes and freeze the ice. So when we cinched the brake up on it, we'd cinched up on that ice and the wheel was a little warm and turned it loose. And it all began because the builder of the Silverton Railroad, Otto Mears, couldn't find a way down this hill with his tracks. It was just eight miles from the end of his line at Albany, that's at the further edge of the cloud, to Ure. My father, uh, Roy Boucher, was a superintendent of the Southern at the, in its final years. And he went to work for the, the Southern in about 1920 and worked for them between 32 and 33 years. I'm reading from the Articles of Incorporation of the Ragran Southern Railroad Company. Article 3. The railway of this company shall commence at Dallas in Uray County, state of Colorado, extending thence southerly to the head of Leopard Creek in San Miguel County, thence down Leopard Creek to the San Miguel River, thence up San, said San Miguel River to Telluride in said county, also extending from the most feasible point between the mouth of the South Fork of the San Miguel River and the said town of Telluride, in a general southerly direction to the said South Fork of the San Miguel River, and thence up said South Fork to a point at or near its head, thence by the most feasible route and over Trout Lake Park, along the Dolores River to Rico, thence down said Dolores River to the most feasible point in La Plata County for divergence easterly, and thence in a general easterly direction to Durango, La Plata County, in the state of Colorado, a distance of about 160 miles. Employee's timetable number one took effect at 12.01 a.m. October 10, 1890 and it was from Ridgeway Junction to Placerville. They didn't arrive in, in Durango, the full, the full 160 miles, until uh, shows on timetable number 11, January 31st, 1892. And uh, the, they had um, two districts. The first district left at 7 a.m. from Ridgeway and arrived in Rico at 2.35 p.m. And then uh, coming on into Durango, it left at uh, 8.15 a.m. and arrived at 6 p.m. in Durango.
1947, the railroad still handled 674 carloads of timber. This despite the fact that the biggest lumber companies had moved away and pulled up the tracks after themselves. At one time, the New Mexico Lumber Company operated a private lumbering railroad north of Dolores that was 71 miles in length. The Montezuma had a similar operation on Hay Camp Mesa, east of Dolores. There were similar operations at Timber Spur, Rust, and a half a dozen small mills near Millwood. Some of these developed from the initial tie-cutting operations of the railroad. Anyone that has ever gone along there, it's just amazing that they could run a railroad through there because there seems to be about 10,000 mud cuts and rock cuts and trestles and bridges and it's, it's just amazing that the railroad operated as well as it did. The space that the firemen had to sit in was probably about this wide next to the boiler and uh, very, very tight, confining area. And my father was a man that weighed 230 to 40 pounds all of his life, a big man, 6'2". And I could never understand how he could fit on those engines, much less fire them. Pinky Linton, who was a engineer on the Southern, came over and hired out as a fireman on the Denver and Rio Grande. And he was a little guy, probably weighed 90 pounds, soaking wet. Little, little, tiny, real thin guy. Uh, very uh, nervous type and uh, tremendous fireman. He, uh, I think when he came to the Rio Grande, he must have been close to 70. And he hired out firing the bigger engines over here. And uh, the man could fire for 16 hours between here and Chama. 70 years old, 90 pounds, and just keep those engines red hot all the way and clean, and uh, he was quite a guy. We see two trips between Mancos and Durango with lumber trains. This wreck occurred on Dallas Divide in November 1943, when engine 455 lost its brakes and ran away. These pictures were made eight months later. The engine was eventually rebuilt and returned to service. 
Consider that when the Silver Purchase Act was repealed in 1893, hundreds of mines in the Rio Grande Southern area shut down. Twelve banks in Denver closed their doors. Dozens of small businesses in southwest Colorado were shuttered, and people left the three counties served by the railroad in droves. Yet, in the closing years, the railroad still carried more ore than any other commodity. 1,500 carloads in 1947. Of course, this compares with nearly 3,000 cars shipped by the Enterprise and Black Hawk mines from Rico alone in 1892. But the survivor, the great Argentine mine at Rico, and the Pandora at Telluride were still heavily dependent on the railroad. Carnotite ore was mined near Placerville. Madame and Pierre Curie, the discoverers of radium, knew that carnotite was one of the richest sources of uranium. They began purchasing the ore in sacks in 1898, and in 1899 ordered an entire carload. In 1921, the famous Eve Curie, a woman with a wide-brimmed flowered hat and sweeping gestures, came to Placerville in person to assess the development of carnotite in the San Miguel Valley. the reduction of this ore, employing more than 400 people, had been built nearby in 1910. Its principal product was vanadium for strengthening steel. A byproduct, radium, was found useful in illuminating watch dials. During World War II, the United States purchased the old smelter at Durango and began reworking the tailings of the various mines along the San Miguel. The yellow cake as the end product was called, was one of the principal ingredients for the first atomic bomb. It'd get wet, and then it'd freeze in there, and then it'd be spraying before you'd get it out, was the idea of it, see. It, it didn't hurt the ore, other than you just couldn't get it out of the car. There's uh, one thing that was an experience, if you ever brought an ore can drag down from Rico to Dolores, especially if you're walking the car tops, it wouldn't break in, because that baby was, oh, it gave you a shaking up like you <laughs> never experienced. That stuff was so heavy. They had these cars built specially, you know, just a box car, but they put a plank on each side of, you know, where the door goes across the car. They'd have uh, I think it was two tube twelves. Yeah. If I remember right, sitting there, so you had a little alleyway there, and then they'd put the ore in both ends. It got to where you could always tell if you had a batch of high grade in that drag, because the mill superintendent at uh, Idorado and uh, at Telluride was always following that car until it got clear on into Montrose. But <clears throat> you could look back up the country and. Here's that Buick following you all the way down the territory. You knew darn well that there was some pretty valuable stuff aboard. The train is shorter than it was at the outset. The assumption is that cars were dropped for loading at Placerville, Primos, or perhaps even the Navy. Two ore trains are shown next. The first goes over Dallas Divide along San Miguel Canyon, climbs Keystone Hill above Vance Junction, and ends along the placid waters of the San Miguel, high in the Telluride Valley. The next departs Vance Junction for Lizard Head Pass with scenes of Butterfly Trestle, the Ophir Needles, and Trout Lake. On its arrival, another train leaves Lizard Head, retraces the route of the first, and then climbs Leopard Creek to Dallas Divide.
there with a the mucking machine and muck it out and put in around and shoot and go home and next morning you'd come muck it out and shoot again. We drilled a lot of holes and shot a lot of powder away. And they had some good ore and it's always interesting to go back the next morning and see if the, how the ore looks in the face, you know. And guys used to pass out when they'd go in there, you know. They'd hire a new guy, he'd go in there and he'd pass out. The air was bad. And I'd tell them, you know, if they'd stay with it for a few more days, they'd get used to it and it wouldn't bother them. <laughs> but most, very few of them would stay. It only took eight Anison to be able to, to put up with your head. And like in Rico there, they got what they call a flower gold. And the guy will have a coffee can bum full of this flower gold. And it, it uh, kind of like a spider web. If you jar it too much, it'll just fall to go to plumb to nothing. But it's formed with water, is the way it forms in them fissures. We could lease the whole mine, go anywhere in it we wanted to, and take out the ore and put it in the bin. And and when they, they'd assay it as we shipped it and weigh it, and then they'd pay us uh, half of what it was worth. And they furnished the machines and the air and everything but the powder. Mixed coal and ore trains are shown. The first southbound from Dolores, doubling Sema Hill. The following day, there are two trains northbound. First, a short train with empties for the coal mines. Next, another approaching Hesperus, switching cars of coal, possibly for the mines, and then doubling to Sema Summit. The helper runs light ahead of the train at Mesa. for both the mines and other railroads is an important commodity, particularly on the southern end. For a while after the silver crash, more coal than ore was shipped through Durango. train is shown en route from Mancus to Durango, passing Buckley, at Hesperus, and finally at Pine Ridge and at Wildcat Canyon.
me, I, uh, I hired out to my, uh, my father. He had worked for the railroad for many years, and uh, they uh, needed a hostler and a freight handler in, in lower here, so I, uh, I was elected because he couldn't find anybody else to do it. <laughs> and at that time, I was 14 years old, and uh, which was quite an experience, and I, I learned to work when I was young anyway. Uh, every once in a while, they'd need a spare fireman or something, and I'd get a chance to ride on a train, and boy, this, this was a big kick, you know. And uh, this was back when I was hostling, and they'd park these engines down here around these boxcars where you had to shovel the coal into the tenders. Well, we, we had two boxcars in there, but if you got five engines in, then you got to move one out, put it on the main track back, and get her back in. Well. I uh, started to move one engine out, and it was still hot, had a good head of steam, but whenever they parked the engines, they let all the air off, see, and turned the compressors off. Well, usually you could just ease them back, you know, and there's a lever, I, I'm sure you know there's a lever on there, you throw it forwards and backwards, just makes it go forward and backwards. Well, I was easing back, and I'm coming back too far, fast, so I throw the lever ahead a little bit, and she goes, tum, 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 tum. <laughs> the old wheel to spin it. Well, I'm starting to go up there, and there's a switch up there, and he, hey, I'm going to be off in the dirt. So then I pull her back. And boy, I'm just going about one or two notches, and tum, 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 tum. And finally, by the time I got her stopped, I'd hit an engine behind me, and it hit an engine behind it. And they had a embankment down there about, oh, what was it, four oh, feet, where they said. I drove that last, the hitch of the last engine out just about in the middle of the street. Oh, boy. That's my, my driving experience. <laughs> in 1947, the railroad hauled a thousand carloads of livestock, almost the entire amount during three fall months. Fall was the busiest time of year for the Southern. Every engine was steamed. Every cattle car, most of which had lain rusting on sightings since the previous fall, was called for action. Some crew members operating beyond their regular divisions didn't see home for weeks at a time. Placerville, for many years, was the second largest cattle loading point in all of Colorado. The trainloads of sheep originated in Rico. We follow an empty cattle train reversing the previous route to just north of Mancos. Murphy was down on the ground. We were traveling pretty slow as we went around a curve up here above Muldoon. And uh, the next thing I know, oh boy, I got slammed up against the drawn the windowsill, wound up uh, peeling me up a little bit. And I uh, was asked, asked Lobby, I said, I didn't give you any uh, 
cut sign or plug them sign. I said, what'd you plug them for? And in other words, he went ahead and hit the air and stopped us. He was looking at me dumbfounded. He said, I didn't do anything. And so we climbed down off the engine to see what was the matter. Went around about the old three car lengths around this curve. And here's a batch of bridge timbers sticking down through the gangway of this caboose. And <clears throat> old Carl, uh, George McLean, he was the conductor on this uh, work train. And uh, Carl uh, Tucker was a cat skinner. And both of them sitting up there in the cupola when this uh, batch of ditcher flats came loose. The kids had been playing in the yard up at Rico. Oh, just more or less kids out here. And I, I remember looking up the track, and here come a flat car. It, it wasn't a pop car. It was just a small trailer they pulled behind the pop cars. Here it comes down the track, and it's doing about 30 mile an hour coming down through town. Alex goes out there and sees it coming, and he picks up a cross tie and throws it out there on the tracks. This flat car goes straight up in the air about and does a complete flip-flop, lands it back on its wheels, and right on down the track it goes. <laughs> I'll never forget that as long as I live. <laughs> yeah. You could figure just about, if, if you had a good pull and, and a decent train, you're looking at about a 14-hour day yeah. pulling a train from Dolores to Durango, which is, you know, 40-some miles. <laughs> Dolores was basically the way station, you know. it yeah. That wasn't, wasn't the main base. You either main based in Ridgeway or Durango. The engine runs light over Dallas Divide from Ridgeway to pick up a stock train at Placerco and bring it back to Ridgeway. An empty cattle train is followed from Durango north to Mancus. It climbs Sema Summit and is shown at Mesa descending. Yeah, we, we'd have a derailment quite often. About 
you're always pulling the car off the tracks. And every once in a while, you get get the uh, engine off the track. You know, you get the locomotive off. And uh, it seems like a real complicated process putting things back on, but it's, it's not really that big of a deal or that time consuming. Uh, very seldom we ever turn anything over. Usually it come off and you're, you're stopped. We pick up another train of empties near Vance Junction and follow it over the top at Lizard Head Pass. A second train follows. We pick it up in San Miguel Canyon and follow it through the Ofer Loop to Matterhorn.
This episode shows you the complete run of a sheep train from Rico to Ridgeway, smoking up the Dolores River Canyon, over Lizard Head, down by Trout Lake, and over to Placerville, climbing Dallas Divide the following day and descending to Ridgeway. My dad was foreman on the railroad from the year he started in Mancus in 1914. And he was um, then transferred over here to Dolores. And uh, when he was in Mancus, he worked just as a railroad laborer. And about three years after he was here in Dolores, then he got promoted to section foreman. He was making a dollar and a half an hour. We always had it planned at 10 minutes to 5 would all run up to the, to the water tank. And uh, if we weren't there, he'd wait for us. And he'd load us all on the little flat car and bring us down into town. And I remember he always used to get so mad at us because we'd dangle our feet over the edge of it, you know. And he'd say, always set your feet in toward the inside because he said, I don't want any of you losing the leg or anything. We used to call it the pop car because it popped and it had this little flat car behind it that Will Allen mentioned that ran away one incident. But I remember he used to take the school teacher every morning. She would meet my dad at his little place there by the house, by the section house, and he would take her up to Stoner. Mrs. Anna McCabe was her name. And dad said she was always so worried that she would, the kids would get to school before she did. And she'd always say, Alex, can you make this thing go faster? And, and he'd say, no, it just can go so fast, you know. And he said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to be late for school, you know. But he always managed to get her there. And then in the evening, she'd wait there till he came back down, and she'd ride back into Dolores with him. Then, you know, of course, hobos at that time were quite common. And I remember many a time when these hobos would get off in Dolores, and at night, we'd hear a knock on our door and there would be a hobo at our door and dad would always give him something to eat and next day he'd see him on the train you know going somewhere <laughs>
The sheep are fed and watered, and the next day they are picked up by the freight en route from Ure to Montrose. The following day, the engine returns, once again, over Dallas Divide for another load of sheep. We follow it over Lizard Head and on to a point just north of Rico. Boy, that was the only transportation between here and Rico and, and Teddy Ride, or particularly Rico, in, in the wintertime. That was the only way you'd get there. Uh, my father was on was firing for a man named, I believe, Lobby. Last name was Lobby, L-A-U-B-E. And they got between Dolores and... Uh, or no, I guess it was between Rico and uh, Trout Lake on Lizard Head Pass and uh, became snowbound. After three days, they, uh, f I believe the um, telephone company or somebody got to them on a snowcat or something like that and hauled them out of there. They kind of got stuck there with the elephant loose. Couldn't go any further. The snow so deep that they just couldn't hardly do anything. At that time, why we tried to walk up there, but we couldn't do it. So we rode the engine just as far as we could, and then from there on, why? Finally, that day, well, in the morning, there was an airplane sent down there with stuff, you know, lunch and everything for them people to, to take care of. After we got through there, we started down the, down the railroad into Rico. And then from Rico, me and Alex had to, had to walk clear down to the sixth house over here. That's a long ways for what we had to walk. But we got here, oh, way early in the morning. Yeah. You walked all night. Walked all night. I remember my dad telling us kids that they were taking food up to 
couple that was stranded, and they had a little three-year-old child with them. And come to find out, my dad and Mr. Rhodes had to eat the food, and he said he always felt real bad about that because he said we, he thought, well, if I ever make it there, I'm sure they're going to be hungrier than we are. And the next day, then, Furman and that crew got up to them. And, of course, they were not, they were in hopes that they were still alive, which they had some doubts because it was cold weather and the snow was quite deep, so, so they were lucky that time. The next day, the weather was better, and the return trip is shown once again on Lizard Head, the Ophir Trussell, Windy Point, and along San Miguel Canyon, finally climbing over Dallas Divide. The final run is from Durango, up Leitner, and Wildcat Creeks, setting out a car near Hesperus, and finally climbing to SEMA Summit.
Through passenger and freights ceased operation on the Southern in 1929 when a mudslide divided the road in two separate pieces. Although the road had been earning enough to cover operating expenses in most years, it never saved sufficient amounts to pay interest on its bonds. The slide nearly finished it off. The road was forced into yet another receivership, but the man appointed by the Denver courts as the new superintendent, Victor A. Miller, proved to be its savior. A major rehabilitation was undertaken at once. This included an ingenious solution to the high cost of passenger operation, the galloping goose. Eventually, seven of these motors, as the Southern called them, were constructed from old Pierce Arrow or Buick parts in their own shops at Ridgeway. When the fifth was delivered in 1933, regular steam passenger operation ceased forever. Even after they were no longer needed for regular passenger service, the geese earned fame in excursion service during summer between Ridgeway and Lizardhead, and also on the southern end of the line. 2,400 excursionists were carried in 1951, half as many as the regular passenger service had carried during the entire year of 1947. This tape shows special passenger excursions operated during the final years of the railroad. On July 13 and 14, 1946, the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club ran its first passenger excursion on the Southern, a trip by goose from Ridgeway to Durango and return. Mishaps took their toll, and three geese were required to complete the trip. As I said, Victor Miller took over as receiver when the, essentially when the aim slide came down and the rig ran just was not gonna go to the expense and trouble of reopening the line. Let it sink. And Miller was appointed receiver and cleaned up the Ames slide, put the railroad back together, developed the galloping geese. Very successful at it. It reminded them of it going down the that old rough track. It was kind of local. Waddled. <laughs> waddled. And for some reason or other, it was called a goose. I don't remember what that was. But it was the galloping goose is what it was it termed that. And, and it's right by. The old galloping goose, about you could figure about once a week, we'd have to go someplace to put it back on the track. Because it, uh, if you ever rode the thing, you know, it felt like it was going to jump all the time, and it did quite often. <laughs> the goose required only a single crew member. This saved the railroad a lot of money. But it sometimes made life a bit hectic for the combined engineer, fireman, brakeman, conductor, mailman, peacemaker between alcoholics, and armed guard. The geese often carried bullion in a box with a padlock near the front seat. Bars were worth $4,000 each, an awful lot of money in depression years. The post office required that the conductor carry a gun, which was also kept in the box. No shipment was ever molested, but in earlier times, Butch Cassidy had robbed the banks in Telluride a number of times. Figured out that it must have been in the fall of 1937, probably around Labor Day, and I dug into the files and found this June 1937 timetable for the Rio Grande. And sure enough, there's a, a an around the circle trip still in effect in those days, where you could go out of here on the Mountaineer Friday evening, 
I would take you through the Moff Tunnel into Grand Junction, south of Montrose. And they offered a bus schedule connecting from Montrose down to Ridgeway so that you could leave Ridgeway at 11.25 in the morning. That was the only part of the trip that was on time. Uh, in those days, for that short period of time, the Big Grand Southern actually operated their geese clear through to Durango. Uh, we were due out of Ridgeway at 11.25 in the morning. There are no meal stops that I see on the timetable. We were due into Durango at 8.24 that night. And by the time uh, we got down to Mancus, and I don't know, it must have been 125 or 30 miles out of Ridgeway. I was somewhat battered and bruised from the constant shaking of that little old car rattling down that track. It galloped all right. We started up Seema Hill, and all I can remember, and really it's the one thing I do remember about the trip, are the headlights off that old Pierce Arrow car body swinging around through the curves and the switchbacks and the turnarounds and the loops up there on Sema Hill. I thought we'd never get there. There was nothing to see except this headlight wandering out through the wild. And uh, I had enough when we got to Durango. I found myself a good sack. On that long round trip that we made down to uh, Durango, coming back, grinding up the west side of Lizard Head Pass, why Morrison Smith and Les Lowe were riding up on top of the freight car body. Wonderful vantage point. It was a lovely day. But uh, Roy Boucher, the superintendent, was along with us, and we stopped at Lizard Head, and he told the two fellows, fellows better come down and get inside. And uh, true to his word, we took off. And if you ever travel 35 miles an hour on a piece of railroad that does has no alignment, is not level, you have missed a real experience. And it seemed to me like every time we hit one of those trestles, the motorman would get it. And we'd come off that thing, go sailing around the curves. And I couldn't figure out what the hurry was, but we sure came down off that hill in one big, fat rush. And as we pulled into Placerville, while we were still moving, Roy Boucher unloaded and ran up and threw the switch, and we pulled into the siding. And here come the West Bucks on schedule. And he had not wanted to stop anywhere up the line for that outfit. We made the meet, but that was the closest one I ever saw, just like CTC. <laughs> then, of course, we got through that escapade, ground our way up over Dallas Divide, dropped down into Ridgeway, everybody exhausted, except a few of us who just had maybe 200 more feet left in us. So we went from the depot down, Started to pull back into the roundhouse for one of those back driving wheels fell off the thing and it lurched like that. And all I could think was, what if that had happened going around that trestle up there at Butterfly? Well, this is Galloping Goose number two. Uh, the railroad referred to them as motor cars. And uh, it was built a long time ago in 1931 to provide some kind of transportation on a railroad that uh, had very little income and couldn't afford to run a steam-powered mixed freight and passenger train. And they ran short of money uh, even to build this, so it was cobbled out of a 
Pierce Arrow car body, a Buick motor from a Master 6, section car wheels, and who knows what all else. Well, this museum was formed uh, unintentionally at Alamosa, in the southern part of the state. This railroad made its last runs in 1951 and was literally a rolling museum. Everything on it was second or third hand or homemade. And I started buying a few things from the dismantler. And uh, it's like any kind of collecting, it, uh, you overdo it. On May 30th, 1947, the club tried a second trip, this time by steam to Dolores and returned the next day. We see it on Dallas Divide, in the canyon, climbing by Ophir and Trout Lake, and two shots taken on the return the following day. Only a few shots of the third trip. By steam to Telluride, overnight there, on to Lizard Head the next day, and then return to Ridgeway. It was made May 28th and 29th, 1949. September 1st, 1951, marked the start of the final steam passenger trip on the Southern and came close to the final days of the Southern itself. It was covered in detail by Otto Perry.
I first met Otto Perry back in 1936. First trip to the Rio Grande Southern was with Otto. We were in Durango, and they were preparing to run a freight train west. They had two engines, the 42 and the 41, which they were getting ready to go. So we took some pictures of the engines while they were servicing them. Then we went down near the depot, which is where the Rio Grande Southern took off, and they put the 42 on the head end and the 41 behind the caboose. Anyhow, we got out around Porter, and the brakeman was sitting on the back end of the, on a little platform on the back end of the tender. And he waved to me to hop on and go along with him. We were only doing about five or six miles an hour, so it was no trouble to get on the train. So we loaded up an Auto's 36 Ford, and away we went. He knew every bump in the road, and uh, got down off the west side of the Levita Pass, zooming along across that piece of street road into Alamosa, got to Blanca, and Auto made a quick left turn. I couldn't imagine what, what was up. But we uh, drove about only about a block off the main road. Otto stopped the car, and there was a hydrant out here. He opened up the trunk of the car, got out two glass gallon jugs, took them over, filled up these two jugs with uh, San Luis Valley artesian water. Put the caps back on, put the put the glasses, the jars in the trunk of the car, and we made a quick U-turn and went right on into Alamosa. He loved that San Luis Valley artesian water. It's the best water in the state, he said. Mm -hmm. uh, Otto had several 3A Graflex. This is the postcard size Graflex. He must have had half a dozen or more of them. And he only carried one at a time, of course, but uh, those were all old cameras. I never was able to buy a new one because they quit making them about 1920. <laughs> so we were always buying secondhand Graflexes and trying to make them last as long as we could. Some of them were pretty good, some of them were kind of in poor shape. But I managed to get two or three pretty good ones. They usually were sharp, the shutter speed was high enough so you could stop a train. That was the advantage of a Graflex. You had one one thousand second shutter speed, which was helpful for high speed trains. Tetheride was a stub end. Only the engine was turned. It ran around its train and pulled it backward to Vance Junction where it could be wide.
After turning on the Y at Lizard Head, the train backed down past Lizard Head Peak itself so that the passengers could take pictures of the train passing the peak for the last time. Knott's Berry Farm came to Ridgeway and, and bought the, the equipment, the, uh, two engines, I believe, and uh, the track, a lot of equipment. And uh, he and Mr. Randow went out, and they both worked out there and were neighbors side by side. And uh, both really, really enjoyed that time of their life. <laughs> but it, it was a lot of fun. It was really a pleasure to, you know, it, uh, it was a learning experience. Yes. In my opinion, thinking back on it now, it was one of the, it was really one of the greatest things that ever happened in this kid's life. Uh -huh. uh, I don't believe on a, on a big time railroad you would ever. I don't. Hmm. It, it was kind of a family type <laughs> program. In other words, everybody knew everybody, and everybody was pulling together to make this thing right. work. Trying to keep it going. And, and everybody uh, seemed concerned, was very, very concerned to keep this thing functioning, it, just like it was part of them. And, and it was, I think that was what made it so great. It wasn't just a job. No, it was, it was a... Uh, it was a family. It, it was something that you felt that you uh, you was obligated to do. Let's let's put it that way. Or dedicated. To dedicated. Well, yeah, dedicated. You know, everybody wanted the paycheck, but there was more but to it, it than just the paycheck. Than Once there was a railroad here. <laughs> 